In this video, we're going to continue learning about our trigonometric functions. But instead of just calculating trig functions for very particular special angles, we're going to learn how we can calculate it for any angle. Um, in our previous videos, we only defined trigonometric functions using a right triangle. And so we have trig functions of acute angles only. But we know that angles can be things other than acute. So how do we define the trig function for those angles? And that's what we're going to learn in this video. So let's let theta just be an angle in standard position. And we're going to let a point PXY be a point on the terminal side of the angle. We're going to let r, which equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, which is not going to be 0, represent the distance from the origin to our point p. Then we're going to be able to define all of our trig functions using information based on this distance r. So this distance just comes from the distance formula that you probably learned in an algebra class at some point. And so let me draw a picture of our situation, and then we're going to write down what all of our trig functions are equal to. So we have an angle in standard position. So I'm just going to say. Here's our angle theta. This one's an obtuse angle. And I'm going to say here's my point P of XY. R is this distance here. And then I can define all of my trig functions. Sine of theta is going to be Y over R where y is the y-coordinate of our point p, x, y. Cosine of theta is x over r. And tangent theta is y over x, as long as x is not 0. And now I can get all of my other trig functions similarly. My cosecant, remember cosecant is 1 over sine, so I get r over y, as long as y is not 0. My secant is 1 over cosine, so I get r over x, and we need x to not be 0. And my cotangent is 1 over tangent, so I'm going to get x over y, as long as my y is not equal to 0. And now all of these definitions are actually they can be applied on acute angles as well. When we're working with an acute angle, these are exactly equal to our definitions using the right triangle with the opposite and the adjacent and all of that. But this is a more general definition that allows us to define our trig functions for any angle. So you're going to want to know how to use these in order to find trig functions of any angle. Let's do an example using. an example. Let's let P be the point negative 5, negative 7. And it's going to be on the terminal side of angle theta, which is drawn in standard position. We want to then find the values of the six trig functions. So 
Well, first let's draw a picture of what this looks like. So the point negative five, negative seven, and I'm gonna be over here somewhere. This is negative five. We'll just say this is negative seven. So here's my point negative five, negative seven. That's on the terminal side of my angle. That means my angle looks something like this. And I need to figure out all of the trig functions of this particular angle. And we know that we're going to need x, y, and r. I already have x, it's negative 5, and my y is negative 7. And to find r, we just use r equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, which for this particular problem, I would have my negative 5 squared plus a negative 7 squared. So that's 25 plus 49 under that square root. That is a square root of 74. So I'm going to be using x equals negative 5, y equals negative 7, and r equals square root of 74 to find all of my trig functions. So let me write down what I know. x is negative 5, y is negative 7, r is the square root of 74. So then my sine of theta Remember, sine of theta is equal to your y over r. So I'm going to get negative 7 over the square root of 74, which again, if I need to, I can rewrite that by multiplying by the square root of 74 on the top and the bottom to rationalize the denominator. And that would get me negative 7 root 74 over 74. Again, if you need to do that, all you have to do is multiply by the square root of the denominator on both or square root of 74 on both the numerator and the denominator to rationalize that denominator. If you're in my class, I personally don't really mind if you leave square roots in the denominator, but some classes may care about that and some homework systems may care about that. So keep an eye out for that. Now, my cosine theta is going to be x over r. So that's negative 5 over square root 74. And again, I could rationalize the denominator if we wanted to, but I'm not going to on this particular one. Just know that you can if you have to. Now, my tangent is y over x. So I'm going to get negative 7 over negative 5 which is equal to 7 fifths. Now for my cosecant, secant, and tangent, and cotangent, we could use all of those definitions that we just learned, and we can also use the properties that we already know. Cosecant is 1 over sine, so it's going to flip my sine upside down. I'm going to get negative root 74 over 7. Secant is 1 over cosine, so I get negative root 74 over 5. And I'm just going to squeeze it in here. My cotangent is 1 over tangent, so I get 5 over 7. Notice it doesn't make a difference if I use the definitions of x, y, and r, or if I use my properties of trig functions, we'll still get the same answer. So there, we just found all the trig functions of an angle that was not an acute angle. So we couldn't do it using a right triangle we could use it doing the extended definition. Now, all of this was defined when we had x not equal to zero and y not equal to zero. But remember, since we end up dividing by x or y on some of these, sometimes if we have a zero in the denominator, well, that just means your function is not going to be defined at those particular points. So now let's find sine, cosine, and tangent for, we'll start with theta is pi over 2. Well, the definitions we just learned, we need to have a point on the terminal side of our angle. So let's first just take a look at what this looks like. Pi over 2, I know, is up here at my vertical axis. It's a 90 degree turn. So here's my theta. 
And so I need a point on this terminal side here. And it doesn't matter what point we use. So I'm just going to pick a point that's easy to work with. Zero, one. I'm going to use that for my point P. And then I can find my R by doing the square root of X squared plus Y squared. Which is going to get me square root of one, which is one. So now I have my x is zero, y is one, and r is one. So that means that my sine of this theta, sine of pi over two, remember sine is going to be y over r, which is one over one, or one. Cosine of pi over two is x over r which is zero over one, which is zero. So I got sine is one, cosine is zero. And then for tangent, my tangent of my pi over two is supposed to be my y over my x, but that would get me one over zero. And that means that my tangent is undefined at this particular value. And that's all there is to it. So if you end up dividing by zero, it just means the function is undefined at that particular point. And so that can happen when we're talking about tangent, cotangent, secant, or cosecant. But for the sine and cosine, it should always be defined. Let's do another angle just to practice. And this time I'm going to give us an angle in degrees just because sometimes that happens. Now, 360 degrees, we know that's going all the way around. So this is my theta. And so I need a point on this terminal side. And again, just pick a point that's convenient to work with. I'm going to use one zero. Now, my R is the square root of your x squared plus y squared. So my r is going to be one again. So I have x is one, y is zero, r is one. That means my sine of 360, which is supposed to be y over r, is going to be zero over one, which is zero. My cosine of 360 degrees is x over r. Well, that's one over one, which is one. And then my tangent of 360 is going to be my y over x. I get zero over one, which is zero. So this time my tangent was defined because I had a zero in the numerator, it's going to be zero in the denominator. Now, sometimes when we work with non-acute angles, we instead use something called a reference angle to help us out. So here's a definition of a reference angle. So for non-acute angles theta, we often find the values of the trig functions using a related reference angle which we're going to call theta prime that little apostrophe we pronounce that as prime in math and this theta prime is the acute angle formed by the terminal side of our original angle theta and the horizontal axis. So if this is my angle theta that's not acute, here's the terminal side of my angle theta. Well, that means that my theta prime 
the reference angle is this little acute angle there that is formed between that terminal side and that horizontal axis. So let's do an example of finding some reference angles before we learn how to use them to calculate straight functions. Find the reference angle theta prime. My first one is going to be theta is 150 degrees. So to find the reference angle, I'm first going to draw what this looks like. 150 degrees is over here. There's my terminal side. And so my reference angle is this bit over here, theta prime. Now, how do I figure out what theta prime actually is? Well, it's the difference between going all the way over to the side and where my theta ends. So going all the way around on my horizontal axis is 180 degrees. And I can subtract off 150 degrees to get that my reference angle is 30 degrees. So if you think about it, here's 150 degrees. And if I was going to go all the way to the horizontal axis, that would be 180 degrees. My difference between those two is the 30 degrees. Let's do another one. Just to make things complicated, I'm going to give us a negative angle this time. Theta is negative 7 pi over 8. So this one's in radians. It's negative, so we're going around clockwise. I'll say here's theta, which is negative 7 pi over 8. And figuring out what this little theta prime is here, it's going to help us to figure out, well, I want to know what this particular angle is. Well, to do that, it's going to help to find a coterminal angle going around that way to figure out coterminal angles for our theta. So, coterminal to theta, we can find negative 7 pi over 8 plus 2 pi. And that is going to get us 9 pi over 8. So the same angle measurement is 9 pi over 8. And then my theta prime is equal to 180 degrees. And then, well, I would have my 180 degrees there, which is pi. And I need to subtract that off of my 9 pi over 8. So let's take a look at what's going on here. 9 pi over 8 is going all the way around in the positive direction until this point here. And my theta prime is going to be that entire distance minus this first bit here, which is pi. So that would give me that bit in the middle. Pi over 8 is my theta prime reference angle. You could also think about it as going all the way around in the negative direction would get me negative pi. And the difference between my negative pi and my negative 7 pi over 8, I get another negative pi over 8 there, but we're going to want it to be a positive angle here. So pi over 8. It's easiest to find a coterminal angle when you're working with negatives and then figure out your reference angle by adding or subtracting depending on the particular drawing. Let's do another one. Part C, theta equals five. Well, take a look at that first. Is that degrees or radians? It doesn't have a pi in it, so you might not think radians right away, but it doesn't have a degree symbol, so this cannot be degrees. We are talking about radians. What does five radians look like? 
Well, we know pi radians, so about 3.14 radians, would be halfway around. And 2 pi, which is approximately 6.28 radians, would be all the way back over there. So 5 radians is somewhere in this fourth quadrant. This is not going to be an entirely perfect drawing. So we'll say that that is theta equals 5 radians. So the reference angle that I want is this little bit here, theta prime. Now, how do I find theta prime? Well, going all the way around the circle is going to be 2 pi. And then I can subtract off my 5 to get this remaining chunk. And I get 2 pi minus 5. You can't really simplify it much more than that. So that is my reference angle right there. Do one last one. Theta is 13 pi over 3. So first thing I want to point out is, is that this 13 pi over 3, that's the same thing as 4 pi plus another pi over 3. So when I'm trying to see what this looks like, we know going around once is 2 pi. So going around twice would get me four pi. And then I have another pi over three. So we're talking about this angle here. And there's my terminal flat. And so what I want is this distance here, this particular angle up here is my theta prime. Well, I'm already going around two pi, another two pi, and then up to pi over three. If I can find this coterminal angle that is just in between my zero and my pi over two, it's also going to be my reference angle. So, what is my coterminal angle? Remember, to find coterminal angles, we just add or subtract multiples of two pi. So, I have 13 pi over three minus, I'm going to just go ahead and subtract four pi. And that gets me just my pi over three as my coterminal angle. Now that coterminal angle is already acute. And so that means my theta prime is exactly equal to that coterminal angle, pi over three. All right, so now we've done this work learning about coterminal angles. Now let's figure out how we can use our coterminal, not coterminal reference angles. We've had all of this practice finding reference angles, and now we can use these reference angles to help us find the trig functions for different angles. So here's our description of what we're going to do. We can find the trig value for any angle theta. using reference angles. Step one, find the trig value of your reference angle, theta prime. And two, just apply the appropriate sign based on the quadrant that theta lies in. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, we have to look at what happens in each quadrant for these particular angles. So let me just quick draw all of our four quadrants. Remember, we defined our trig functions based on x, y, and r. And r is always positive because it's talking about a distance. So the sign of our trig values depends only on the sign of x or y. If I'm in this first quadrant here, my x is positive and my y is positive. If I'm in quadrant two, my x is negative and my y is positive. 
quadrant three, both my x and y are negative. In quadrant four, my x is positive and my y is negative. So to figure out what sign I need for my trig functions, I just have to look at what x and y are for the appropriate angle. So let's go ahead and do an example where we do this. Let's evaluate cosine of five pi over six using a reference angle. So let's first look at what five pi over six looks like. Five pi over six is this angle here over in quadrant two. And this is my reference angle here. So let's first find the reference angle. Going all the way over to the x axis would get me pi. But then I have to subtract my 5 pi over 6 to get my reference angle. So my reference angle is pi over 6. Now, what is cosine of that reference angle? Well, this is one of the ones we're supposed to have memorized. This is one of our special values for cosine. I get square root of three over two. Remember, we're supposed to have our sine and cosine memorized for pi over six, pi over four, and pi over three. So I get square root of three over two for cosine of pi over six. Now I just need to apply the appropriate signs. So theta, which was five pi over six, is in quadrant two. And that tells me that since cosine is going to be x over r and x is negative because it's in quadrant two, this tells me that cosine of five pi over six is the exact result that I got for five or from pi over six, but it's going to be negative because I'm in that quadrant two. So we use the reference angle pi over six to find that particular trig value. And then we looked at where this fell in our coordinate plane to figure out if it was going to be positive or negative when I went back to my original. Let's do another one like this. Cotangent of negative 120 degrees. Well, negative 120 degrees is going to look like this. Since it's negative, let's first find a coterminal angle that happens to be positive, and then we'll find our reference angle. So negative 120 degrees is coterminal to negative 120 plus 360 degrees, which is 240 degrees. So now I need to find my reference angle. So my reference angle, now I'm looking at 240 degrees, which is still in the same spot, so I'm going the other direction around. There's my 240. My reference angle is this little bit here between the horizontal axis and where that theta prime would end. So what is my reference angle? Well, I need to do my 240 gets me all the way there, and then I have to subtract off the 180 that gives me this piece here to leave just this little acute angle. So my reference angle is all the way 240 degrees minus the 180 degrees 
and that leads me my acute angle of 60 degrees. So now I need to find my trig value of the reference angle. So I want cotangent of this reference angle. Cotangent of 60 degrees. Well, I know that's cosine of 60 over sine of 60 degrees. And those two values are some of our special values that we're supposed to have memorized. Cosine of 60 degrees is one half. Sine of 60 degrees is square root of three over two. And one half divided by square root of three over two, I get to flip, multiply by the reciprocal, and I get one over the square root of three, which is the same thing as square root of three over three if I rationalize my denominator. So now, take a look back where we were to begin with. Find what sign we need for this value. I know my answer is going to be square root of 3 over 3 or negative square root of 3 over 3. My angle that we were talking about originally is over here in quadrant 3. My x is negative and my y is negative. And my cotangent is supposed to be an x over y, and they're both negative. So that means I get a positive. A negative divided by a negative will be positive. So my cotangent of negative 120 degrees is a positive square root 3 over 3. All right. Now let's do something a little more complicated. Given that cosine of theta is negative three over eight, and that sine of theta is less than zero, so it's negative. Find sine of theta and tangent of theta. So notice that I have no idea what theta is, but that's okay. What I do know is that my cosine is negative and my sine is supposed to be negative. So sine and cosine negative means that my x and my y are negative, and that means I'm in quadrant three. So whatever my angle is, it's something over here in quadrant three. So I'm just gonna say, here is my theta. And now, since I know that cosine of theta is supposed to be my x over r, and I get a negative three over eight. My R is this distance here, eight. My X is negative three. And my Y, I don't know what my Y is. My Y is whatever this vertical distance is here. So how do I find my Y? Well, I get to use a Pythagorean theorem. I know that negative three squared plus my y squared is going to be eight squared. And so I have nine plus y squared is equal to 64. So y squared is 55. And that means my y is going to be a square root of 55. But since I know I'm in quadrant three, it needs to be negative square root of 55. So now what we know, x is negative three, y is negative square root of 55, and my r 
is eight. And now I have everything I need to find my sine of theta and my tangent of theta. Sine of theta is given by y over r. So I get negative square root of 55 over eight. And my tangent of theta is given by y over x. So I get negative square root of 55 over negative three, which gives me positive square root of 55 over three. And so now we were able to find these trig values without even knowing what our theta was. We had enough info to figure out if it was positive or negative, and then we could just use all of our skills to fill in the missing information. Let's do one last example where we use actually a trig identity to help us find a trig value. Given that sine of theta is negative 5 over 13 and that theta is in quadrant 4, find cosine of theta and tangent theta. Using identities. Well, the first thing I want to point out is since we're in quadrant four over here, that means that my cosine is going to be positive because my x values are positive. So cosine theta is going to be bigger than zero because we are in quadrant four. Now I'm going to use one of my Pythagorean identities. Remember that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. And now let's plug in the info that we know. Sine of theta is negative five over 13. And so now I can solve this for cosine in order to figure out that piece of information. So my negative five over 13 squared that's 25 over 169. So I can move that to the other side of the equation. And that gives me 1 minus the 25 over 169. That's 144 over 169. And then I can take a square root. And I get 12 over 13. And I only need the positive square root because I know my cosine is supposed to be positive. So there's cosine. And now I can use another relationship to find tangent. We know that tangent of theta is sine of theta over cosine of theta. My sine of theta, we said was negative five over 13. And my cosine theta, we just found was 12 over 13. So if I flip and multiply by the reciprocal, I'm going to get that my tangent of theta is equal to negative five over 12. And so when you're trying to find these, you can use identities like what we just did here, or you can use things like we did in the last problem where we just kind of set up the triangle using our information and we're able to figure out the trig values using our x, y, and r. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them below. If you're a current student of mine, you can also email or ask in office hours or class, and I will see you guys next time.